John, if the phone rings, John. You pick it up quick. I'll pick it up quick and put it back down. Where's my book? My book on the Chief Justice. I had it right here. Did you move? Over there. Good afternoon. I'm Chilton Varner, the president of the Supreme Court Historical Society. It's my honor and pleasure to welcome all of you today to our virtual lecture. While I wish we were face to face, person to person, I do recognize the value of a virtual lecture that can capture a larger audience of our membership uh, around the country, indeed around the world. A critical element of the Supreme Court Historical Society is to educate the public about the work, the role, and the independence of the Supreme Court of the United States, as well as the federal judiciary as a whole. We take that work very seriously, and we seek your assistance in assuring that we do a good job. Give us your feedback and suggest any programs for the future that you believe to be of interest. Without our members, the society would not function. Today's speaker is Professor Jonathan Lurie. He is a seasoned veteran of the society's in-person lectures. And so it is an honor to have him with us today for a virtual lecture uh, to celebrate Law Day. He is a professor emeritus of history at Rutgers University, Newark, where he joined the faculty in 1969. He is one of the premier historians in U.S. legal history. He is also a prolific author, having written several volumes about Chief Justice Taft. Professor Lurie received both his bachelor's and his master's degrees from Harvard. He received his Ph.D. in history from the University of Wisconsin. In addition to his stellar career at Rutgers, he was a visiting professor at West Point and served as the historian and archivist for the United States Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces from 1987 until 2001. Professor Lurie, you are familiar with our lectures and the protocols so I will not keep your audience from you any longer. I will simply turn over the podium to you. Thank you for being here, for sharing your insights, your understanding of history, and being a longtime friend of the society. It's all yours, Professor. Thank you for being here. Okay. Thank you very much for that very kind and generous, and I fear overdone introduction, but I'm very grateful to hear it anyway. And I'm delighted to be back under the auspices of the Supreme Court Historical Society, for whom I have many fond memories of past meetings. Now, today we're going to talk about the one of the many contributions Chief Justice William Howard Taft made to the court he loved. And we celebrate in particular the centennial of one such measure passed largely because of his pressure, persuasiveness, and influence. So let's start with a little background about the man who, a little over a century ago, became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Until recently, 
it must be admitted. Neither time nor history have been very good to the reputation of William Howard Taft. Uh, to be sure, he was a one-term president, an unenthusiastic occupant of that office, I might add. He was defeated for re-election, and he was sandwiched in between Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, two of our more dynamic, shall we say, chief executives. Yet such treatment, while it's understandable, is in fact, I would suggest undeserved. In recent years, however, a number of historians, including this one, have re-examined the Taft legacy as a whole, not just his four years as president, but his career as a whole, and found much more to applaud therein. If you will look, for example, at recent books published by Kevin Burns or Lewis Gould or Michael Corsi or Jeffrey Rosen, as well as my own book on Taft, you'll get a sense of some revisionist historiography that's been going on for the last 10 or 15 years. Chief among the contributions we would highlight to Taft is a series of measures of direct interest to the Supreme Court on which he assumed the post of Chief Justice in October 1921. Discussion about one such proposal will occupy much of us this morning. It being the establishment of the Judicial Conference which this day begins its second century of service. To this day, of course, William Taft is unique. He remains the only American in history ever to have served both as president of the United States and chief justice of the Supreme Court. And such a duality in itself makes his life worthwhile to study if only because this unique event may probably never occur again. But in fact, there's much more. Indeed, rare is the individual who at the end of his days could look back on such a varied resume as Taft had compiled. He was born before the Civil War started. He matured during the Gilded Age he observed the effects of industrialism, economic expansion, urban growth, agrarian and labor unrest, the progressive era, imperialism, as well as the tragedy of World War I. And in his last decade, he experienced the effects of the Jazz Age. So he saw it all. An incomplete summary of his life would include college, law school, several years as a judge in the Ohio Superior Court, a term as one of the youngest solicitor generals in the history of that department, appointment to the newly created Circuit Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, appointment as president of the commission to govern the Philippines, secretary of war, president of the United States, Professor of law at Yale, he declined to be considered as a candidate for its presidency, and Chief Justice of the United States. Indeed, looking at that career as a whole, when it came time for advancement, somehow Taft had invariably managed to be in the right place at the right time of the right party and with the right friends. Above all, Will Taft worshiped the judiciary. There he was happiest. There he found total fulfillment in his calling. And he did not exaggerate when he wrote, quote, I love judges and I love courts. They are my ideals that typify on earth what we shall meet hereafter in heaven under a just God. 
unquote. By the time Warren Harding appointed Taft as Chief Justice, June 30th, 1921, his nominee had been well acquainted with courts. As a lawyer, trial judge, appellate jurist, administrator, and president, as president, he appointed more U.S. Supreme Court justices in a single term than any other president since George Washington, by the way. Professor of law, and now at last on the court, primus inter pares, first among nine equals, he saw much that he felt could be improved in the federal judicial system. And Taft had already published some of his views concerning it. And late in 1920, when totally unexpectedly, I might add, President-elect Harding offered him a seat on the court, the former president responded that it would have to be the chief justiceship or nothing. Now he had two reasons for such an inflexible position. One was personal, while the other was professional. In early 1921, only two of the justices Taft had appointed, Willis Van de Venter and Malin Pitney, remained on the bench, along with Justices James McReynolds and Louis Brandeis, among others, two Wilson appointees whose nominations Taft had considered very objectionable, although for highly disparate reasons. One of them was too radical, the other of them, even for Taft, was too conservative. The former president indicated to Harding, however, that he would be uncomfortable being junior to all of them. But there was more than personal preference behind Taft's eagerness to gain the center seat. While president, he had called for reforms in judicial administration early in his term, but without success. Well aware of the extended backlog of litigation on the high court docket, in October 21, it consisted of almost 350 undecided cases generated in part by the end of World War I, as well as the onset of prohibition. Even worse, the average time for an appeal to be heard after filing ran more than 18 months, more than a year and a half. Further, in the decade since leaving the presidency, between 1913 and 1921, Taft had railed against the inefficiency of the federal court system in general. And once he became Chief Justice, and Taft was appointed and confirmed on the same day. Not unanimously, I might add. There were three or four holdouts in the Senate, but he was, as I say, confirmed the same day he was appointed. His appointment never went to the Judiciary Committee. He determined to move ahead on several changes in federal court administration. Now, as president, Taft had been a competent and able administrator of his executive department. Now as chief justice, he sought to be the same for the federal judicial branch, which he believed was in critical need of such oversight. It required a similar system of sound management as did departments within the executive. Until 1929, excuse me, 1922, the federal courts represented numerous mini judicial fiefdoms with most state district lines as their boundaries. Of course, they were intended to be separate from the executive and legislative branches, but in a real sense, the district courts were also independent of each other. To be sure, as Felix Frankfurter and James Landis later recall, recalled in their still valuable study 
the business of the Supreme Court of the United States, a study in the federal judicial system. Landis and Frankfurter recall that Congress had created a hierarchy of courts, but not of judges. As a result, a district judge was confined to his district with the result that some federal district judges, some federal district courts, such as those in New York, could be terribly overburdened in their dockets, while district courts in Montana, Idaho, or South Dakota must have far fewer demands on their time. Yet there was no way to transfer federal judges to where they might be needed. And it was this inflexibility, as well as the unfortunate result of an excessive localism endemic in Congress that Taft sought to remedy. As Chief Justice Roberts reported in his 2021 report on the federal judiciary, and I think it is appropriate that my talk begin with a reference to our current Chief Justice and will end with another reference to Chief Justice Roberts. Anyway, Chief Justice Roberts wrote, wrote that, quote, Taft wanted to supplant the prevailing culture of isolation in which each federal judge was, in his own words, left to paddle his own canoe, unquote. And Roberts couldn't resist adding, nor can I, from quoting Roberts' footnote, once you get past the image of Big Bill paddling a canoe, consider that he knew well how to navigate the halls of Congress, unquote. And indeed he did. Now, although he had already made history by becoming the first ex-president, and thus far the only ex-president ever to go on, go, go on the court, let alone become Chief Justice. In the fall of 1921, Taft made history yet again. He became the first Chief Justice ever to appear in person before the Senate Judiciary Committee to present, as it were, a sort of state of the federal judiciary report similar in purpose, I would suspect, to the State of the Union messages the president is required to give according to the Constitution. With the exception of his inaugural address, as president, Taft had never spoken directly to the Congress or to its representatives. As Chief Justice, however, he would appear before various committees on multiple occasions during his nine years in that capacity. And I repeat, that had never been done before. The Chief Justice had never appeared before a congressional committee as far as we know. Secure in his office now, immune to any exigencies of the electorate, Taft made no apologies for his novelty or his new efforts. True, he willingly violated precedent by appearing before various congressional committees, quote, but I am determined to exercise such influence as I have to help the judicial country, to help the judicial system in the country. Precedents that keep judges away from congressional committees who are to help are not precedents that appeal to me. Further, I hate to be in the attitude, he added, of a continual beggar from Congress, but I seem to have arrived at the court just when it was necessary, unquote. But as you will see, Taft did more than just try to interact with Congress. He involved, as never had happened before, his fellow judges, and not just federal appellate judges. Taft, early in his tenure as Chief Justice, wrote to every federal district court judge. Indeed, one of them who would become famous in his own right as one of our most distinguished district court and later appellate justices, Learned Hand. Learned Hand wrote to Taft, and I can't resist quoting from Learned Hand's letter. 
it is a great comfort to know the interest you take. To be frank, we have never felt it before your incumbency. You are the first Chief Justice that ever recognized such things as district courts, except when they were officially brought to their attention to reverse, unquote. Now, one can't say how effective Taft's appearances before congressional committees were, but a measure of such effect might be the success that the measures he support had on the final record. And I might add that the great majority of his congressional appearances took place in the House not so much the Senate. Why? Taft had been quietly informed by Iowa Senator Albert Cummins that as Taft put it to his son Robert, quote, some of my old enemies on the Senate Judiciary Committee rather resent my being prominent in pressing legislation, unquote. In a chamber where rank, ritual, and tradition live on, having a former albeit defeated, chief executives suddenly restored to national prominence, as it were, by now appearing on behalf of the Supreme Court and pushing for new legislation probably was an unpleasant source of irritation to some former Theodore Roosevelt report supporters in the Senate to confront. And Taft understood this very well, and he had no objection to confining his appearances mostly to the House, which he did. Again, it's clear that everything Taft specifically sought was eventually enacted by Congress, although not without some changes that reflect the political context in which Congress continually operates. In addition to his appearances before congressional committees, the chief's campaign of encouraging public support from state bar associations, as well as his calling public attention to the needs of the federal judiciary, represented a new noteworthy change from past Supreme Court practices. I suppose Taft wrote in 1922 that I weigh down reform by my advocacy of it in arousing the opposition of certain elements, especially in the Senate. But I don't see why that should prevent my initiating matters when nobody is likely to do so, unquote. Now, some Southern conservative Southern senators found Taft's new approach unsettling, if not troublesome. One observed correctly, that Taft's speeches, quote, were different from those made by any other chief justice, unquote. Senator William Harris from Georgia claimed that the judiciary is going to be injured and people will not have the same high respect for it if the chief justice and his brethren continue to make speeches in public and not in their line of duty as has been done recently, unquote. Harris added that, quote, I think the justices should keep out of any matters that are political. I do not think it is the part of wisdom for a Supreme Court justice to publicly discuss matters to be decided by Congress, unquote. Indeed, Taft may well have regarded judicial reform as purely technical and apolitical, the extent to which that is an accurate perception is beyond our discussion here. Within six months of taking his seat on the court, the Chief Justice quietly proposed several specific changes concerning the federal judiciary. First, there should be at least 16 additional federal district judges appointed replete, of course, with the usual accoutrements of local patronage and political considerations. 
By the time this proposal worked its way through Congress, however, the number had risen to 24 new federal judges, 24. That is more, as Frank Fitter and Landis remind us, than those originally created by the first Judiciary Act, which had established the federal court system in the first place. But Taft went further. He wanted what he labeled as a quote, flying squadron of district court judges who could be dispatched to various locales where the need for additional judges was manifest. They would be judges at large, as it were. And unlike their contemporaries, they would be without local responsibilities and attachments. Further, they would be assigned by the Chief Justice, as he saw fit. And while Taft had no doubt concerning his capacity to make these decisions, others did not share his self-confidence. Southern Democrats in Congress objected to the bill, not least because these 24 new judges would presumably be appointed by a Republican president, Warren Harding. Indeed, Taft's proposal flew in the face of deep-seated congressional localism. Mississippi Senator John Williams faulted what he described as, quote, a perambulatory judiciary, unquote. He opposed, quote, carpetbagging Nebraska with a Louisianian, certainly to carpet bagging Mississippi or Louisiana with someone north of Mason's and Dixon's line, which will certainly happen if this bill passes, unquote. North Carolina Senator Lee Overman's reaction may be tried, cited as typical. Why should the Chief Justice, he asked, be permitted to, quote, send a man from, send a man from Maine to California or from North Carolina to Wisconsin to hold court? What does he know about law in Wisconsin? Unquote. Overman added, I do not think any man in the Senate would stand for such a bill as that, to have roving judges to be sent around at the will of the Chief Justice. It is fundamentally wrong, unquote. As for jurists such as Taft, who pushed this measure, quote, they were good men, able men, but impractical, unquote. Unlike Taft's proposal, an effective piece of legislation had to be both practical and practicable. The same type of parochial congressional localism was reflected in opposition to Taft's proposal for an annual judicial conference. Nebraska Senator George Norris, who should have known better, fulminated against quote, judges who would arrive in Washington at the expense of the taxpayers. And what will they do? They will be dined every evening somewhere and run to death with social activities. I do not believe there is any man who can stick his legs under the tables of the idle rich every night and be fit the next day to sit in judgment upon those who toil, unquote. Norris had no doubt that such a judge, honest though he may be, cannot get away from the atmosphere that will surround him. And 99 times out of 100, it'll affect him and get him in the end, unquote. You might note of George Norris that he started as a Republican, turned to a progressive, became independent, was reelected as an independent in 1936 and defeated for reelection in 1942. Texas Congressman Fritz Lanham urged that the entire provision for a judicial conference be stricken from the record, stricken from the bill rather. In reality, he asked, what is the necessity for an annual junket merely to bring the record of the condition of the various districts? 
All the district judges needed to do, he wrote, was to submit written reports to Taft, quote, thereby eliminating the permanent annual expense of a conference, unquote. Montana Senator Thomas Walsh echoed Lanham. The proposed conference means absolutely nothing on earth except a junket and a dinner. Such an expense had no justification whatsoever, unquote. Aside from this predictable carping by a minority party, Democrats who probably realized that Taft's proposals were all going to pass in one form or another, other members of Congress reflected a legitimate concern that judges were supposed to, quote, judge, not watch the workings of the judicial system, nor to explore its defects and devise remedies, unquote. Such was the work of Congress, not the courts. Judges argued Senator John Shields from Tennessee should never be authorized to exercise powers not judicial. They should be holy judges, always judges, and nothing but judges, unquote. Now, in spite of all these concerns, within barely one year since he joined the court, Taft had pushed, persuaded, and cajoled Congress to adopt these three measures he had championed. It must be admitted, however, that there was little evidence of marked enthusiasm on the part of Congress for them, and they all took a final form different from that originally proposed by Taft. His plan for a flying squadron of judges, for example, never reemerged from the legislative turbulence it encountered. On the other hand, Congress did authorize a large increase in new federal district judges, as I wrote, some 24 of them. Nor did the authority he had sought to assign districts, uh, ju district judges to temporary duty elsewhere survive unchanged. Indeed, during the first congressional markup, the Senate Judiciary Committee gutted the entire proposal. For reasons that are not clear, however, the committee later reversed itself and restored the provision to move judges around, subject to two specific limitations. The senior judge of the circuit from where the request for an additional judge had come had to sign a certificate of need, and two, the senior circuit judge of the circuit to which the existing jurist was permanently assigned had to give his approval to the temporary transfer. Only after these two conditions had been met could Taft move to bring in another judge on temporary assignment. Now enactment of these two measures left the third final legislative proposal one to establish a judicial conference of senior judges. The legislation survived, as it does to this day, a hundred years later, but the judicial conference of 2022 is very different from the one enacted in 1922. The original statute provided for a group of 10 the nine chief circuit judges, all white, all male, plus Taft. Almost a century later, in 2019, the Judicial Conference, as it is now called, had expanded to at least 28 members, including four African Americans and 10 women, a far cry from all white males in 1922. In addition to the chief judge of the circuit, one district judge from each circuit is now included as a member of the conference. He or she is selected by majority vote of the appellate circuit and district judges within the circuit. Further, 
a district judge serving as a member of the judicial conference may either be active regular service or a judge retired from service, a senior judge, in other words. In other words, there's a great deal of flexibility in who is selected to serve on the judicial conference. Actually, it appears that the original idea for a judicial conference may have come not just from Taft, but also from the efforts of Harding's attorney general, a rather notorious Ohio political operative, Harry Dougherty. In 1921, Dougherty convened a special committee composed of three federal judges plus two United States attorneys. Dougherty observed, when you study the district the different districts of the United States, you find there is not that uniformity of sentences, customs, rules, and regulations in the various district courts that there would be if the district judges were better acquainted and if an opportunity were afforded for conferences, consultations, and comparisons, unquote. So Dougherty's special committee return with several recommendations, one of which, one we're most interested in, recommended the establishment of a judicial conference to include, as I said, the nine senior circuit judges plus staff, plus the attorney general. That addition was later deleted by Congress. And to this day, the attorney general is not a member of the conference committee, but quote, upon the request of the chief justice may report relating to the business of the several courts of the United States with particular reference to cases in which the United States is a party, unquote. So nowadays, I suspect there are many times when the conference is meeting that the attorney general will indeed appear before them. Now, a key responsibility of this new conference would be to recommend, quote, any needed legislation to Congress, unquote. Taft enthusiastically endorsed the proposal and suggested that a section be added that would require each district judge to, quote, file annually with his senior circuit judge a report of the business disposed and that's still remaining on the docket of his court, unquote. Both the House and the Senate passed their own versions of the Judicial Conference Bill. But as I say, there was less than enthusiasm and it required two separate congressional conference committees to reconcile their differences. And finally, on September 14th, 1922, the Judicial Conference Bill was passed. Now, there is no doubt that enactment of this new statute increased Chief Justice Taft's administrative control over the federal judiciary to some extent, if only because he could now peruse a series of reports from all district court judges concerning their actions as well as preside over an annual meeting with senior circuit judges from all across the United States. But as a distinguished professor of political science at Princeton observed some 60 years ago, by no means had Taft become, quote, a commander in chief of federal judges, unquote. True, an important step towards real coordination of court administration had been taken, but it provided an instrument of persuasion rather than of command. Although federal judges probably gained a more acute sense of belonging to a group of professional men who shared common responsibility and common problems, their courts remained largely independent. 
And no one realized this more than William Howard Taft. Less than six months before his death, he died in March of 1930. Taft concluded that, quote, the fate of a chief justice in attempting to make the district and circuit judges do what they are not disposed to do is a difficult one, unquote. Earlier, he had written to a district judge in Oregon who had been sitting on a patent case which had been argued four years before. Of course, Taft candidly conceded, quote, I write this letter with no assumption that I may exercise direct authority over you in the discharge of your duties. But as the head of the federal judiciary, I feel I do have to appeal to you in its interests and in the interests of the public to whom it is created to serve to end this indefinite situation. Starting perhaps with Chief Justice Earl Warren, and continuing to the current incumbent chief, Justice John Roberts Jr., probably no successor to Taft would have found it necessary to write such a letter as this. Indeed, during the 90 years or so since the death of Taft, his original conference of senior judges has been transformed. In 1939, Congress created the administrative office of the US courts. And in 1948, changed the name of the old Taft Committee to the Judicial Conference of the United States. Now they function together in a closely knit tandem. One serves as the administrative agency of the United States federal court system replete with some 30,000 employees and a budget of more than $7.8 billion in fiscal year 2021. While the Judicial Conference functions as the national policymaking body for the federal courts. Of the five key functions now claimed for the conference, the ghost of Taft, as it were, hovers over four of them. The conference will, one, comprehensively survey business conditions in the courts of the United States, unquote. That's exactly what Taft called for originally. Two, plan assignments of judges to or from courts of appeals or district courts where necessary, unquote. That is the contemporary version of his ill-fated flying squadron concept, which sort of didn't get off the ground, if you'll pardon my aeronautical reference. Three, submit suggestions to the various courts that promote uniform management procedures and the expeditious conduct of court business. The original version of this function was enthusiastically endorsed by both Taft and Harry Dowry. Fourth, and this is a new one, in, a, in accordance with chapter 16 of title 28, the conference shall exercise authority for the review of circuit council conduct and disability disorders. Chapter 16 of Title 28 of the Federal Code probably would have been unknown to Taft. It deals with complaints against a district judge and how they will be resolved, both by the chief judge of the circuit as well as by the chief justice of the conference. Finally, the conference today will study the operation, will continuously study the operation and effect of the general rules of practice and procedure in the federal courts as prescribed by the Supreme Court pursuant to law. Such ongoing review is exactly what Taft had, had envisaged for his Council of Senior Circuit Court judges in the first place. 
Chief Justice Roberts in his year-end report recalls that when Taft presided over the early sessions of this conference, starting in 1922, quote, the most pressing issues were court congestion and workload management, unquote. In 2021, there were at least 20 standing committees of the Judicial Conference. Their somewhat esoteric concerns extend to rules of practice and procedure, criminal law, defender services, judicial security, federal state jurisdiction, information technology, and judicial conduct and disability to mention only a third of them. Further, the Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure now has five additional advisory committees dealing with appellate rules, bankruptcy rules, civil rules, criminal rules, and evidence rules. Of special interest, however, to Chief Justice Roberts is the matter of judicial integrity. In this context, again, Chief Justice Roberts quoted Taft, who as ABA president in 1913-1914 had pointed to the quote, duty to remove as far as possible grounds for just criticism of our judicial system, unquote. Referring in his final report, to the matter of fiscal of financial disclosure and recusal obligations, Roberts did not mince words. Quote, let me be crystal clear. The judiciary takes this matter seriously. We expect judges to adhere to the highest standards because public trust is essential, not incidental to our function. Indeed, quote, Collectively, our ethics training programs need to be more rigorous. That means more class time, webinars, and consultations. But it also requires, Roberts added, greater attention to promoting a culture of compliance, even when busy dockets keep judicial calendars full, unquote. Such was a topic which, quote, will receive focused attention from the Judicial Conference and its committees in the coming months, unquote. Congress has authorized the conference and the Judicial Councils, quote, to respond to complaints of judicial misconduct. And such innovations have enabled the Judicial Conference to move effectively, to more effectively perform its administrative budget and regulatory work. In conclusion, virtually all of what Taft sought in 1921 has now become a reality. It has done and continues to do just what he hoped such a body would undertake. If he could see what his conference of senior judges has become during its first century of existence, Howard Taft will probably be very pleased as well he might. Now, Washington DC, as any visitor will tell you, is always under construction. Never, it would seem, is there not a site where some structure is either going up or going down. And there are more, one suspects, monuments and memorials in Washington than in many other American cities. Yet at first glance, apparently there is no monument to William Howard Taft. How could this be? How could the legacy of this man who had held the two highest national offices in the country, those of president and chief justice of the United States be so diminished if not ignored? If, however, one takes a careful second glance around Capitol Hill and in the vicinity of the Library of Congress, one will view a massive structure that my fellow legal historian, Professor William Wiesek called, quote, as impressive, 
neoclassical in spirit, balanced, dignified, imposing, reverential, symmetrical, majestic, intimidating, dramatic, and above all, inspiring, unquote. This is, of course, the home of the Supreme Court, one that Taft had longed for for many years before he occupied the center seat. He was able in his last years to quietly persuade Congress to appropriate more than $9 million for its construction, as well as to view the plans of his chosen architect, Cass Gilbert. He even saw a model of the proposed new building, but he died before the groundbreaking ceremonies which were held in 1932. That's certainly one appropriate monument to William Howard Taft. Is there another? One does come to mind, and it has been the subject of my comments with you this morning. While not as august in outward appearance as the Supreme Court building, in reality, it emanates from within its walls. It's the Judicial Conference, which normally meets twice a year, and which we have seen preceded the new building by more than a decade. Let the current successor to Chief Justice Taft, Chief Justice John Roberts Jr. have the last word. I am grateful, he wrote, to the judicial officers and staff of the Judicial Conference for their devotion to the cause of justice. So should we all be. Great pleasure to speak with you good people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lurie. Um, I'm Jim Duff, an executive director of the Supreme Court Historical Society, and your lecture today has been absolutely fascinating uh, to me, especially, I hope, to the rest of our audience. Uh, we would like to take uh, some questions from the audience in the time we have remaining, and I'll uh, kick that off with an observation or two of my own and a question and, and get to as many of the questions as we can in the time left remaining. Um, I, I, on a personal note, um, a monument that I'm uh, uh, familiar with from my hometown, I went to Taft Senior High School in Hamilton, Ohio. So I was uh, more, most interested in uh, your, your lecture and your books uh, that you've published on President and Chief Justice Taft. Uh, I also served as Secretary of the Judicial Conference of the United States for 12 years under uh, Chief Justice John Roberts, and so uh, too have a special affinity for Chief Justice Taft and, and his work. So I'm very grateful uh, on a personal note that you've shed light uh, on his great achievements uh, and enduring achievements. Um, and I know our audiences as well. I'll begin with a question about the importance of um, a, a judicial administration under the Judicial Conference of the United States to judicial independence. And in your lecture, you mentioned some of the resistance in Congress uh, to Taft's ideas about the formation of a judicial conference that um, judges, I'm paraphrasing, judges should just stick to judging and not worry about administration. But the dangers to uh, judicial independence without the court's own self-governance are great. And uh, I'll make an observation and a question. Um, before there was a judicial conference, there, uh, the, the, those who represented the courts and the uh, judiciary's interests before Congress were from the Department of Justice, the executive branch of government. And so Taft realized how crucial it was for the judiciary to represent its own interest before the Congress. And so my, the question is, uh, uh, do, do you see uh, the, uh, judiciary's self-governance and administration as crucial to its independence. Certainly, certainly. I couldn't agree with you more. 
um, it, 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 it's not just it's not just the Supreme Court we're talking about or federal courts, but any court should be concerned about its judicial independence. And one of the, I remember one, my earlier work on the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces when I was their historian, I read how the chief judge of that court, a former governor from Rhode Island named Quinn, Robert Quinn, would each year go down to the Appropriations Committee and lay out his requests for money. And if Congress was in the mood to give it to him, they would. For the most part, they did. But the idea of judges having to request money from the elected officials always is difficult to reconcile with the concept of independence. And I'm afraid yes. it will always be like that. Yes, yeah. yes, I think that you make a good point. Um, questions from the audience. Uh, Chief Justice Taft's legacy uh, of the conference and the construction of the uh, court building are perhaps his best known contributions. Both were a testament to his political experience, which as you've pointed out, was not um, his favorite part of his past career. How do you account for that, uh, that, that his greatest achievements were, even as Chief Justice, were somewhat in the political realm, or are there other achievements you, you uh, could point to as well? He, he hated politics. <clears throat> he wrote to his wife, whose nickname was Nellie. No one called her Helen. Everybody <laughs> called her Nellie. And he wrote that politics, quote, the thought of it makes me sick unquote. And he hated campaigning. He did it. He did it uh, very well in 1912, faced with a situation that had not fallen to any incumbent before, a challenge from his predecessor demanding to reclaim his office. This was, of course, Theodore Roosevelt. <clears throat> Taft campaigned gave many, many speeches, was privy to the political ins and outs, which shored up Southern Republican support for his renomination and blocked Roosevelt's forces from gaining the necessary votes to capture the nomination in the summer of 1912, leading Roosevelt, as you know, to bolt from the Republican Party and uh, form the bull moose. Taft, by the way, always regarded the outcome of the 1912 election as a victory for the Republican Party. He said the best thing we did was to make sure that Roosevelt would never be elected again. <laughs> and uh, it took him some years to reconcile to Roosevelt, but they did. And by the end of Roosevelt's life, he died in January 1919. Roosevelt and Taft, if they were not the close friends they were in 1909 to 1911, they certainly were much more friendly. And Taft wrote a very moving tribute to Mrs. Roosevelt. And there's a picture taken at the Taft funeral of Roosevelt standing alone by the recently completed grave of Theodore Roosevelt silently weeping, which is a very, very beautiful picture of Taft all by himself in front of the man he had served as vice president. So um, he didn't like politics, but he knew how to play the game. <laughs> and he loved appointed office. More than 89% of the offices he held were appointed. He only had to run for office, I think, twice. Once during his tenure as president, and once when he was running for re-election in the Ohio Superior Court, and he won, he won that election. He had a remarkable career, as you've pointed out, and your books are, are, are uh, a great um, recount of, of that career. And you mentioned so many of them at the outset of your, of your remarks today. 
Solicitor General of the United States, but probably the youngest one ever, uh, was, was quite, he was in his 20s, I believe, when he yeah. was Solicitor General yeah. of the United States. Late 20s. Remarkable. And that, that may be Bobby Kennedy being Attorney General at, uh, in his th early 30s, I think. <laughs> but, but, well, um, he, had a, he had an interesting experience as, as Solicitor General. He would tell, tell his mom and dad, who were still alive at the time, in, in those days, the court ate lunch on the bench. Mm. They ah. didn't adjourn. They didn't leave to go to lunch. Lunch was brought to them on the bench. And if a lawyer was talking, they just ignore him and eat their lunch. It's <laughs> a great story. I never heard and that. After, after calls, <laughs> he, he, if it was a good case, they'd listen to him. If it was a bad case, they'd eat lunch. <laughs> and he, he referred to them as the nine mummies. And his mother said not to worry that he would get used to talking in front of them. And in 1921, he became chief justice of the nine mummies. Well, he, he built, he had a building constructed in which they have their own uh, uh, beautiful dining room now where they can have lunch and don't have to eat on the bench. So that's another achievement uh, of the great. It's a, it, uh, it's an incredible yeah. building. And uh, in, 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 my, uh, in my book on the Taft Court, I was able to find two sketches of Cass Gilbert. That, mm illustrate what he hoped he would accomplish in the building, which we see in front of us right now. Uh, it truly is an awe-inspiring place to visit. It's beautiful. It, it truly is. Um, Professor Lurie, I, I, you and I, I think, can talk for hours on this, and I'm going to turn to, uh, and I'd love to, uh, maybe we'll go offline, but uh, a couple, time for another two quick questions. I'll, I'll uh, combine them uh, because I want to get to as many as we can from our, our watching audience. Did Chief Justice Taft ever promote the adoption of a model code of judicial ethics for the court, for the Supreme Court? I guess there's there, one for the lower courts. and, and... I, I don't recall, but okay. I do not think he would have opposed anything like that. Okay. And, and uh, would have taken last... an assumption that you did that. I'm were, sorry. I think he would have taken as an unwritten assumption that you do that. Oh. You have such a code. The last question uh, uh, is uh, the, 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 uh, uh, he's, he's curious about uh, the person who's asked is curious about the pay gap between lawyers and judges. Was it as pronounced uh, during Taft's time uh, as it is and has been recently, and if that was a concern at the time, the, 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 the pay, pay scale gap, for judges. The gap between lawyers and judges? And yes, yes. Uh, um, it was quite pronounced in the 1910, 1920 progressive mm -hmm. era. <clears throat> There's a letter from David Davis, who was the Democratic candidate for the presidency in 1924 against Calvin Coolidge. I think I have my dates right. Coolidge uh, uh, Davis had been a ambassador to the United, to England, had served his country very well, and had come back to practice law. And Van de Vetter and Taft wanted him on the court and wrote him a letter hinting that if he would give the word, he would be named. Hmm. And Davis wrote a very friendly, candid letter back saying, thanks, but no thanks. I'm happy here. I don't want wealth. I want independence. And I can gain it here from my partners who are collegial, the clients are collegial. And what he was saying was, you don't offer enough money for me. <laughs> It's not worth my effort giving up my practice. Mm -hmm. And when you consider what the judges made in those days, compared to what people like Claude Wallet or, or Wickersham or other successful yeah. lawyers, by the way, right. the law firm of Taft, Claude Wallace and Wickersham is still around. It's a big yes. New York firm. Uh, can't compare to what yeah. the judges were getting 
So yes, you're right. There is a, a gap. Professor Lori, I, I can't thank you enough for your uh, presentation. I would love to resume uh, a conversation with you either up at Rutgers or invite you down here to join me. At, at, uh, it's, it's been fascinating and we're grateful for, for you doing that. I also wanna to thank today uh, members of the Taft family who joined us today. It was a pleasure to have you with us and we're grateful for your participation. Now I'm going to shamelessly promote Professor Lurie's books, which are available from the Supreme Court Historical Society's gift shop at www.supremecourtgifts.org. And uh, I'm going to hold them up. There's the Chief Justiceship of William Howard Taft, 1921 to 1930. And we have William Howard Taft, The Travails of a Progressive Conservative, both great books by Professor Lurie. We highly recommend them to you. Um, thank you again. The Society's next virtual program is our annual lecture on June 6, uh, 2022. Chief Judge Jeff Sutton, uh, also of Ohio, by the way, will be speaking uh, on states as laboratories for constitutional experimentation. Registration is open to society members and can be found on the society's website at www.supremecourthistory.org. I also wanna thank our partners in our uh, civic education outreach at the Judicial Learning Centers and federal courthouses in Sacramento uh, California and St. Louis, Missouri. We're grateful for their um, uh, joining us. And uh, a reminder that we will send out a survey later this afternoon to everyone who's registered in advance. Please do respond to it. We want to make these programs as interesting and accessible to as many people as possible. Thank you again, Professor Lurie, and thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>